the heating it's the number one problem here in the pits but this crew they found a way to cool things down yellow yellow there's nothing mellow about high. track in this summer's hottest movie, Days of Thunder. There's nothing mellow about it. On race day, if you're not ready, they're not going to wait for you. And for me, getting ready begins with new Exxon Superflow. It's twice as effective against engine wear as leading motor oils. Because on those grueling, thundering afternoons, I want all the engine protection I can get. New Exxon Superflow. It's twice as effective. At 12, marker. Actually, what we're doing is flying on the ground. I really like things that get my adrenaline pumping. Except for sex and good food, there's nothing like it after that. Really exciting to watch. you've been to an NASCAR race or seen him on ESPN and said, I'd love to do that. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Jerry Punch, and rarely will we ever get a chance to live that fantasy on the racetrack. But starting next week, each and every one of you can at the movie theater. One of Hollywood's most successful production companies has turned its attention to NASCAR. By combining some of the best from film and racing, Days of Thunder hopes to put you, the race fan, in the thick of the action. It all began four years ago when Tom Cruise and fellow actor Paul Newman came to Daytona and met NASCAR team owner Rick Hendry. Paul Newman and Tom Cruise came down to drive the cars. And Tom got in the car and he went out and ran 185 miles an hour and he said, you know, I want to make a movie about this. This is neat. And uh, we became friends and we started driving together and we raced a couple of races together. And every time our teams would test, he would come in and drive. After driving on both amateur and professional tracks, Cruz decided to develop a film around racing. He brought his idea to producers Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer. Tom Cruise came to Jerry and I and wanted to make a movie about automobile racing. And we got exposed to it and got excited by the characters that participate in the sport. It's not about the sport that's exciting, it's the people who do it and why they do it. Let's go! And these guys have have enormous amount of guts, courage, and bravery to go be going over almost 200 miles an hour for five, six hours and get slammed into walls. Um. Co-starring in the film are Robert Duvall as a legendary crew chief and Randy Quaid as the team owner who wants to win the Super Bowl of racing at all costs. Whatever else we do from here, we win Daytona. The other cast members found themselves caught up in the world of NASCAR. The level of danger these guys put themselves through is, you know, it's, it can't be compared to any kind of other athlete. They're always living life on the edge. I'm going to take this rookie once and for all. Just want to win the race. And you'll do whatever it takes to win that race. You're going into a turn that's only that's built for one car. And there are two cars going in that turn. There's only one car going to come out. Somebody's got to give, and it's Rowdy Martin. For Cruz, one of the benefits of making a racing film was the opportunity to do his own driving. He's really a good driver. He's got a lot of ability. Uh, in our profession, we look for drivers that have uh, what we call feel for a car. They can drive from the seat of their pants. Tom has that. Tell you what, it blew my mind. We, we took the test car to Charlotte over here, and uh, 
it was it was ready to go and we needed to test the car anyway but we was wanting to test it with another driver so one day we took it over there with one of our drivers so for the next and uh, he ran a 3150 and 60 with the car which we felt like that was pretty good at that point well the next day we said we'll take Cruz over there so Cruz come in he gets in the car and we'll put new tires on it and his first lap was 3140 one character in the movie who provides a different point of view on racing is Dr. Claire Lewicki, played by actress Nicole Kidman. She sees what people in the audience who haven't seen a race would see, you know. And I think a lot of women out there, I don't know, um, you haven't been exposed to, to NASCAR. Nicole herself was won over to the sport after just one spin around the track. I was fantastic. It was really, I mean, I, I really like things that get my adrenaline pumping. I'd never watched a race before. I'd never been involved. And it is incredibly exciting when you're there. You know, I can understand um, why people get hooked on it. Real life NASCAR drivers served as consultants and performed stunts on Days of Thunder. For NASCAR pro Greg Sachs, bringing this story of racing to the screen was a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's just been a ball because I got so many things going on, you know. A racer like myself, I don't like downtime. I like excitement. And this film has been a lot of excitement for me. You know, we're going 200 miles an hour out here. And uh, we've got a lot of small planes that fly at 150. So actually what we're doing is flying on the ground. Trap! Days of Thunder is a film that captures both the excitement of NASCAR and the spirit of the drivers who travel the circuit. We never wanted to make a race car movie. We wanted to make a movie about character and story. And we found wonderful characters. And that's why we're here. I've got you in here. Come in here. On action, I'm going to be take off your headset. Right. Yeah. The research started okay, almost two years ago when we first got involved with Tom. And Don and I kind of followed the racing circuit and got to meet the Daryl Waltrips and the Richard Petty. And in turn, we were introduced them to Robert Town. Academy Award-winning screenwriter Robert Town traveled the NASCAR circuit, meeting the drivers and researching the script. We've built our life around the automobile. And these people have done that only more so. And they have a passion for it. I think that this movie is based on these people. The characters that I've written are based on these people, and not just cars going around in circles. And I believe that we have gotten a sense of these people in the film. Where did you see your drivers from? The Eagle Rock, California. He's the Yankee. Duvall's character, Harry Hogg, was inspired by legendary NASCAR crew chief, the venerable Harry High. In fact, many of the scenes from the film are straight out of the illustrious career of this NASCAR legend. I'm going to give you an engine low to the ground, extra big oil pan that'll cut the wind from underneath you. Hendrick Charlotte Bay City Chevrolet is the basis for the sponsorship on Cole Trickle's car. In fact, when Hendrick and Hyde agreed it was time for Harry to come out of retirement, it happened in a field where the Hendrick Motorsports Complex now sits. On this very piece of ground in 1983, I had my race boat stored at Harry Hyde's shop. And I was over one day and we were just talking and Harry said, if someone would give me an opportunity to build another car, I could still whip them. And I said, well, Harry, what's involved in building one car? You know, uh, we, had, we had stopped boat racing, and we thought, well, build one car won't be that big a deal. We had sportsman cars. So that's how it started. That one car turned into five cars, and we hired Jeff Bodine. But it all happened here one Saturday in the rain. And uh, it didn't happen out on the farm, but that was close. Yeah, we brought the old man out of retirement. How about that for an old guy? Timmy drove a heck of a race, and we couldn't be any happier. And I'm just so proud of Harry and Tim that this year, and I don't know how many he's going to win. He said he was going to win eight. I think he, can you win eight? You still oh, I, pr I promise you I'd win six, so i got two more to go. Harry, he doesn't need to appreciate your job, do you? Well, he sure as hell does. How can he expect a race if he don't know what a race car can and can't do? Think he can drive? Oh, he can drive. He can drive beyond the limits of the tires, the engine, the car, anything else. To bring the characters and action of Days of Thunder to life, Simpson and Bruckheimer teamed once again with Top Gun director Tony Scott. Tony is a real hard charger. And when you take a picture as difficult as this, this many logistics, because of all the racing 
and, and the complexity of the plot, Tony, uh, with his storytelling ability and his enthusiasm and his sensational eye, gives you something really unique. Yeah, what I need is uh, give him room. Get, give him room. So each you... track I've tried to give its own different stamp or characteristic in terms of the way I've actually filmed it. I mean, always trying to cover a different aspect. Of, of the race or the stunt. Here we're trying to get cameras inside the car, underneath the cars, so we're, we're photographing these stunts in positions I don't, don't think people have done them before. This is the, an incredibly tough movie. It's like being at war, because you can't second guess things, and you really can't understand how things are going to work mechanically. Before you do it, you just have to go do it. We look at some of the footage we initially did at the first races we were at. Uh, we learned a lot. The angles aren't right. The speed's not right. Uh, so we're constantly adjusting. So as the races progress in the movie, so will the excitement. Using multiple cameras at each race, cinematographer Ward Russell created a unique look. The racetrack audiences are historically used to seeing a race from the top. We're trying to get you know, involved you totally in, in being a race car driver and, and to try and show the speed and the excitement that's actually going on on the track. A state-of-the-art camera vehicle was built that could travel within the pack and get spectacular footage with a remotely controlled camera. Just need to come down a bit. The car itself is uh, it's an El Camino 86 El Camino body sitting on a Winston cup card. Modified, modified, modified chassis. And the big, big difference is the, the remote control inside, is, is the safety of it. We both have helmets. We're inside roll cage, bars protecting us on the side, and we can get out there and mix it up with the race cars. Even the actors got involved in shooting many key scenes. You shoot a scene in the car with, uh, with great concentration. You really have to keep an eye on the, on the car staying in the place you wanted to stay in. Also, uh, turning the camera on and off. OK, roll it, and please slate, Kerry. Bringing it all together required an incredible amount of planning and communication between filmmakers, drivers, actors, and technicians. We have several different communication systems. The drivers are on one specific radio system that communicates with uh, during the races, actually somebody from NASCAR. I'm on the channel with all the camera operators. The ADs are on a whole other channel so that they can talk about whatever they need to do. So basically, it's three different radio systems that it takes to make the whole thing work. In addition, the film crew had to work around the limitations of a live national broadcast. Someone who could appreciate that is Conrad Picciarello. He was producing the ESPN broadcast that night the filmmakers started shooting in Bristol, Tennessee. Basically, placing the cameras for them was a logistical hassle. We were there first, and our cameras uh, are in position to cover the race. They have a different agenda. Theirs is there to cover the excitement of different movie angles, tight shots of the actors. Still, we had to work together. The effectiveness of television's in-car camera has brought NASCAR fans into the front seat of the action. It was a challenge of the filmmakers to go one step further, and it was no easy task. I knew that their in-car footage would really be exciting after seeing the cockpit footage for Top Gun. They really knew where to place the cameras. That has really made auto racing. Uh, when we started first with them in auto racing 10 years ago, they were huge. They're really maneuverable. They can do anything that you can think of in order to show you different angles of the car. Once the filmmakers captured the action from the driver's point of view, they had to deal with a more complex challenge. Now, if you're an avid auto racing fan, you probably remember many of these scenes. But suppose you wanted to recreate them, intensify them, have them happen on cue. How would you do it and make sure no one got hurt? When the camera cars yeah, up yeah, hold for up. two beats, then, yeah. then okay. open the hole up. Give me two beats, box them for two beats. You get one, two. Yeah, basically, Tony lays it out uh, on storyboards in his head, and then he'll come out here, and he's got his little toy car so that we all have a rough idea of what we're trying to accomplish. When you guys are supposed to be in, in racing formation, it's 100 laps in. So many people are involved in each of these shots that you need to brief each of the individuals so it's good that we have, like, a, a mini production meeting before each setup so that each individual knows what they're doing. One, for safety factor, and two, that we know what we're getting out of the shot in the end. They explained what they wanted in that scene. And I said, well, that's no big deal. We do that every week. And uh, they said, well, 
we're going to have stuntmen come in and do it. And when they said what the stuntmen would make for that particular deal, I'd like to, you know, I'd ask them for the opportunity to try it. And I got as close as I could without being in camera view and watched that stunt and decided they could have it. <laughs> And then who's driving it's incredible right to get the action to, to fit the script. You know, it's easy to write the script, but then we have to copy it out here on the track. That's the tough part. You'll spread out, and I'll just uh, he'll go in between you and me. And then if you sat down and watched any of the uh, uh, pit conferences we're having with all the different stunt drivers and everything, you'd see how involved it was to try and uh, describe these things. It's incredible. Roll both cameras, Steve. Roll them. You know, it's real interesting what we found out was we figured we could get the cars to go 100 miles an hour and it would look like they're going 150 not so you really got to get them up to speed for the audience to really experience what it is to go 150 to 200 miles an hour and it also depends on which racetrack you're at if you're at a short oval uh, like bristol which we went to in tennessee which is a night night race it's only a half mile track so the cars can't reach the speeds they do at a super speedway uh, like this this particular one here at Daytona where they reached almost 200 miles an hour. So how does a NASCAR professional or Hollywood stuntman negotiate a turn at 200 miles per hour? Well, truth be told, they get a little help from the design of the track itself. If you stand here on the apron at Daytona and draw an imaginary line up across the top of the wall, you're actually some three stories high. It is this 31 degree banking that keeps the cars literally from flying over the guardrail. To perform the film's spectacular stunts, the real life racers push their vehicles to maximum speeds. In certain instances, they found themselves going against their natural instincts. Everything we do is to make the car go straight and handle good. And now we've got to reverse all our thoughts and try to make the car handle badly, get sideways, slide around, all at 170 miles an hour. What I have to keep in mind is to not let Tony make me go too far. And yet, yeah, I want it to be a great film, so I push myself a little more. But I got to try and walk that fine line between uh, Tony's insane tactics and what I think I can get away with. At the start of the production, the filmmakers began with a pristine fleet of cars to be used for shooting the racing scene. We try to make them as realistic as possible. With each car that we had in the field, we went to each of the teams. We got their specifications in paint. We went to where they got their decals, and we got photographs of their car. So we took their photograph and all their parts and tried to make it identical to their car. But maintaining this fleet was no easy task. The cars get up to enormous speeds and get in these corners sometimes a little bit out of control. So when we're filming something in turn two, by the time the cars get to turn three, they might be out of control and into a wall. We've built about 60 cars for moving ourselves and maintain them. I think today we're down to two cars that are the original cars that we started with. What was the ultimate fate for those 60 cars? Well, most had short film careers. In fact, Rick Hendrick has found himself overseeing a Days of Thunder junkyard behind his garage in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is a Superflow car that you'll see in the movie. This is a car that Cruz takes the spectacular crash that eventually puts him in the hospital. In this crash, the car gets on the nose and goes end over end. In order to duplicate the type of crash that you'll see, this car was installed with a cannon mounted behind the seat that had a charge of dynamite on top and a telephone pole that would be driven into the ground. At a speed of 120 miles an hour, this car would go down a straightaway. The driver had directions on the dash that said, turn wheel to the left, push button, good luck. Spectacular crash, not much left of the car. Don't think I'd want to try this one. This is a city Chevrolet car. We built 14 of these cars. We had four ready at all times during the filming of the movie. When in a movie, when they wanted to do another take, that meant another car. So we had to have four on standby at all times. Sometimes shooting four takes in a time period of maybe three to four hours. Some of the older cars that they bought uh, come from older days, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and then they put new sheet metal on the cars uh, and made them look new. Mostly that was the cars that they wrecked and were using for show cars and one thing or another. But mostly what we worked on was the actual race cars that did the racing footage. Never thought I'd have Richard Petty's car wrecked sitting behind our building. Oh. 
There goes the fender. There goes a the quarter panel. As they blow the motors, they come in here, and we change the motor as quick as we can. It takes us approximately five hours. We brought cars in in the morning, and it's been out back on the track in the afternoon. And then it's come back that night again for another motor. Five hours to change an engine? Not bad for a Hollywood film crew, but consider this. At Dover, Delaware, Dale Earnhardt's crew managed to pull a motor and change the camshaft. And they did it inside an hour to get Dale back on the track. Hard work, but not too much fun. Back together. Even Earnhardt himself up trying to work. He wants to win this championship real bad again this year. The most fun part that I've had is uh, some of the high-speed work we've done with the race cars down at Charlotte and all when we've had the cameras positioned on the track. You know, and let's say here we may run 200 mar miles an hour tomorrow morning and uh, have a $100,000 camera sitting up here in the bank, which I'm going to miss by an inch or two. So as a matter of fact, uh, one time I clipped the uh, sandbag, which is holding it down. We're going to do a stunt this afternoon with a hood flying off, which is going to prove real exciting. Get a whole pack of cars behind it, and uh, God knows what's going to happen. You know, I've, I've warned some of these guys in the back to uh, uh, change the style a little bit, wear different helmets, full face helmets. So if this hood happens to come through somebody's windshield, I mean, we're not planning on losing any cars in this stunt, but I got a feeling there's going to be some action. I think everybody ought to hang around. <laughs> Unfortunately, stunts don't always go the way you planned. Well, the car in front, it blew its uh, bonnet there. The lid came back and just was supposed to hit somewhere back here. It hit there kind of hard and kind of opened her up like a can, didn't it? <laughs> I tried to duck, but I didn't have time. Two of the most memorable NASCAR crashes happened to two of the sport's most legendary drivers. Bobby Allison cut a tire and went for a wild ride at Talladega. He was unhurt and later joined his young son, Davey, in victory lane. When Richard Petty tangled with a Daytona trial, he might have been shaken up, but he was back behind the wheel the next week in Richmond, Virginia. The toughest scene is when we're going to reenact uh, a big crash between uh, uh, Bobby Allison, a combination between his wreck at Talladega and Richard Petty's wreck here in uh, Daytona. So how did Scott get the incredible close-up of the car spinning on its nose? Simple. Just cut a car in half, run a six-inch steel rod through the middle of it, and add a diesel engine. Presto, you have the gimbal car. With so many of you out there watching NASCAR, the producers felt it was essential to get every detail right, from the characters to the settings to being part of the actual races. In the interest of telling the story, you've got to place cars that function as the cars that our characters are driving within the context of reality. And in this case, reality was the Daytona 500. So we had to qualify two cars um, driven by, uh, you know, real drivers. But Jimmy Johnson at Henrik Motorsports asked me if I'd come out and qualify one of the movie cars. A couple of weeks ago, they brought a car into uh, Bristol, and the car didn't make the race because the circuit is that competitive. And NASCAR has gone ahead and make us, uh, everything had to be absolutely legal. You know, they wouldn't let us just put a car in a field. We had to have a car that was competitive. It's a race car, period. We had to go through the same ritual as everybody else. NASCAR tech line, the inspections, everything. This is not a, a fake car for the movie. This is the race car we've installed some cameras in. In addition to having its tires changed and being gassed up at every pit stop, the main Chevy Lumina was serviced by a special film crew in charge of reloading the cameras. We have one in the front of the car and one in the back. Every time it comes in, when we change it, we pull the whole thing out. And another camera and film will go back in. I probably can beat half the field even with the extra 250 pounds. That's what's hurting the car is the cameras. We've got about 200 pounds, 100 in front of the right front tire and 100 pounds behind the right rear tire in absolutely the worst place you could want it. The car is driving about like a tank with the cameras in it. Without them, it's a competitive car. It's very strong. We really thought we had a shot at sitting on a pole here with that car. They want to make it as realistic as, as possible. And they've gone to great lengths to make sure that uh, they portray the sport exactly as it is. They had to go in and they had to make Daytona look like Daytona on race day. And actually, it was filmed uh, weeks after. So they had to set the pits up exactly like they were on race day which meant having all the uh, NASCAR team's umbrellas. You'll see all the pit boxes. Uh, these pit boxes normally cost about $2,500 to $3,000.
The NASCAR didn't need them to be regular pit boxes, so they made them out of masonite. They're all just props. Uh, the uniforms that we bought, uh, Paramount estimated they paid $390,000 just for crew members and race drivers' uniforms. We bought uh, all the helmets. They had 75 helmets that the stunt drivers used, that Tom used. We bought all the trophies when they filmed in Rowdy's house and they had his, he was a Winston Cup champion. Uh, I have the Winston Cup championship trophy that, uh, that was supposed to be Rowdy's. We bought uh, 51 radios. They had to have con uh, contact with the cars as they were on the racetrack. We bought all the radios, we bought all the headphones. All the helmets were equipped with headphones and speakers. We bought all the gas cans. There were probably 100 gas cans. Uh, bought all the fire extinguishers and we bought 33 of the race cars. 22 of them I brought back, 11 I left down in Daytona, and I guess uh, the man that uh, they had rented the warehouse from put them in a dumpster because they were totally, totally unrecognizable. Here at Daytona, we had two movie cars in the race, plus the 42 car field of race cars, and, uh, and all of the cameras that were mounted around the tracks and on booms, and in the cars. I never dreamed that we could come to the Super Bowl of motorsports and run the Daytona 500 with 150,000 people in the stands and uh, CBS coverage and then work the movie into it and pull it all off. At the Daytona 500, we actually had 28 individual cameras working. It was a record. Panavision came out and gave us an award for having the most cameras ever used on any one production. It's the complexity of the race, the complexity of what we're filming there that demands that many cameras. The racetrack is two and a half miles around. And to be able to film everything that's going on within a three-hour period of the race takes a lot of different angles. You can't just move a camera from one spot to the other. Good. Cut camera, Steve, once again, an excellent. Bill France, uh, that runs NASCAR, he says, you know that if one of those movie cars wrecks someone winning the race, he said, you and I are going to be in big trouble. And we told the, uh, the drivers in the movie cars, look, stay out of trouble. If it looks like you might be getting ready to get into a problem, he just back off. If we had wrecked one of the front runners that's running for the multi-million dollar Winston Point and had a shot at, the, at winning the Super Bowl of auto racing, uh, we would have been run out of town on a rail. As it was, we decided to do it the way we did, and thank goodness it worked out. And they were only out there for the first 100 miles. That was understood. They went there all 400, you know, for the whole day. For the cast and crew of Days of Thunder, working on this film and living in the world of NASCAR is an experience they will not soon forget. I'm a race car driver. I mean, how often do individuals get to be race car drivers? And come out alive. <laughs> the degree to which you're awake is the degree to which you've never been that alive. Being that alive creates an experience that's exceedingly powerful. And it's the reason people probably go back into the boxing ring when they shouldn't and the reason guys who are too old continue to race, because except for sex and good food, there's nothing like it after that. Fundamentally, you're always looking for that high again. And the guys who are really gifted, like uh, Darrell Walter, Darrell, Darrell Earnhardt, and you got the King Richard Petty, who's still chasing it at his age, not having the, all the success he used to, is because life is pretty boring once you've experienced being that alive for four or five hours. What's gonna make it unique is the story and the characters. And if we can get the audience to fall in love with these characters, and want to live their life and sit behind the wheel of one of those race cars and become Tom Cruise for two hours, we're going to be very successful at our task. See, a driver gets his bell rung and a couple of lights flicker and loses what he needs more than his eyesight. He loses his need.